uh, if you're on, if you read the newspaper, you you read it, <laughs> or uh, you know watch the news. Where I tell you what, you have you know Fox News on this side, then you have CNN on this side. They keep oh boy, and then you have the uh, you know the 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 Fox News and CNN um, um, loyalists. You know that. You know, well, they said this on CNN tonight. Oh, well, Fox News said this tonight. And so they just sit there and they rally each other up. And, you know, it would be so funny if it wasn't such a widespread problem. And, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, my, my purpose tonight is not to take sides. And I'm not going to talk politics. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for or any kind of nonsense like that. But I will say this. The situation that is currently in America is not unlike... Um, the situation that was going on in Israel um, in Jesus' day. Um, there were a lot of different extremists. There was a group called the Zealots who believed that Israel just needed to stop submitting to Rome and just go to war and kill them all. Um, in fact, uh, one of the disciples actually was a Zealot. Um, well, before Jesus met him. Um, there were a lot of foreigners in Israel. Um, the longtime enemies of Israel, Edom, the Edomites. Um, actually, Herod the Great was an, uh, distantly an Edomite, an, an Edomite. So I can imagine the Israelites weren't too happy about having an Edomite ruling over them. <laughs> you know, then they had, uh, because of, of how Rome kind of redrew the lines, um, you see a lot of different people who shouldn't have been there. Okay, So like, you know, the Canaanites or the um, Tyrians or, you know, go down the list of these people who were foreigners and didn't really belong there. Um, and then there was also the Romans, who obviously Israel was not real fond, fond of. That's why the, uh, why the uh, Pharisees and the tax collectors were trying to trap Jesus by saying, hey, should we pay tithes to the emperor or not? Because if he said, hey, no, don't pay tithes to the emperor, well, then they had him. That was, uh, you know, uh, was it called when you rebel against uh, uh, the government? What's it called then? Um, there's, another, there's another word, I can't think of it. But yeah, basically those things. Uh, civil disobedience. What? Treason. Yes. Ryan, you <laughs> saved me, buddy. Yes. Treason. Yes. And that would have had him killed. And then, hey, they, they would have, Jesus would have been out of their hair. So there's that. Um, so it's not unlike you know, what was going on in, in Jesus' day. See, it's easy to read the Gospels and say, hey, you know, everything's basically going good because. The Gospels don't give as an exact account of what's going on. You didn't say, oh yeah, by the way, while this was going on, there was this rebellion over here, and that was terrible, and then this thing happened over here, and there was all this bad. He, they don't care about a lot of stuff. All that they care about is saying, hey, here, here is Jesus. This is the one who you believe in to be saved. That's the point of the Gospels. So because of that, when we read the Gospels, sometimes we just forget that there's a whole thing going on there. You know, um, Rome took over Israel in about, uh, if I remember correctly, it's about 64 BC. So Rome had only been in control of Israel for 60 years before Jesus was born. That's not that long. Um, and then Jesus died in 30 AD. So we're talking about not even 100 years that Rome was in power. See what I mean? That's, let's say somebody took over America and you're an American patriot, and so you're not very happy about this. It's kind of like that. Except that Israel had been in Canaan at this point for a lot longer than we've been in America. So, <laughs> Anyways, um, so Luke chapter 10, verse 29 says this. And I'll go ahead and flip to the next point here so you can have that on the screen. Luke chapter 10, verse 29 says, But wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied and said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers, and they stripped him and beat him and went away, with, um, leaving him half dead. And by chance a priest was going down on that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. Now, some people will try and tell you that there's hidden meanings in this parable, like, for instance, the fact that he was going from Jerusalem to Jericho. There is no evidence in this parable that there, that there are any hidden meanings or mystical teachings. The main point is that the road from Jerusalem to Jericho was downhill, and there were a lot of places on that road for um, people to hide and ambush. So, don't lose the what's it, don't use the forest for the trees, or whatever. Um, likewise, a Levite also, when he came uh, to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him, 
And when he saw him, he felt compassion and came to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. And he put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when, when I return, I will repay you. Which of, the, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? That is, was it the Levite, the priest, or the Samaritan? And he said, the one who showed mercy toward him. See, he doesn't say the Samaritan. That's a little bit too much to stomach. I can't say that. That one. The one, you know that one. Um, then Jesus said to him, go and do the same. So, let's point out a few things, just to kind of... Just to kind of bring a little bit more into this. Now, it says a man was going down from Jerusalem. It doesn't really say what his ethnicity is. That's not really the point. But what is the point is that there are these two people who have a chance to help him. One is a priest and one is a Levite. Now, these are the people who are in charge of the religious things of Israel. You know, um, Israel was made up of 12 tribes. Well, technically 13, but one of the tribes wasn't counted. And then another one turned into two tribes. And there's this whole thing there. So let's try to skip all over all that, and let's just say there were 12 tribes. Uh, and one of these tribes was a tribe called Levi. And Levi was responsible for um, taking care of the temple, for you know the sacrifices and all these things. Um, so basically, they were the religious people. They were pastors. If you could compare it to today, it would be, you know, hey, a pastor and a worship leader, okay? So here, here's this, here's this person who's beat up, and the pastor walks by, and then the worship leader sees him and walks by him too. That's that's fair enough. I mean, it's not exactly equivalent, but you get what I'm saying. Um, and then, uh, so you have this thing here. So there's a few things to point out. The first is that there was a long feud between the Jews and the Samaritans. Um, if you've gone to any of my classes, I've talked to this in great length, so I'll just kind of give a little bit of a, I don't know, footnote, I guess. Uh, it started out, Israel was a nation um, in the ancient Near East, which is uh, next to the Mediterranean, um, between Turkey and Egypt. Good enough. And a nation called Assyria came down and um, destroyed the northern part of Israel. And, <coughs> excuse me, and when they did, they forced the Israelites to move out, and they moved these other people in the place. Now, these people came to be known as Samaritans. Well, time went on, and you know they kind of integrated parts of the law, you know Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They integrated parts of it while still trying to have their pagan idol worship and that kind of stuff. Um, the equivalent would be um, Christians who still have Kachina dolls in their house. They're basically the exact same equivalent. Uh, so, okay. <coughs> Excuse me, my throat is killing me. Um, so then a few, I think it's, a, let's see, from 722 to 586, so over 150 years later, Babylon, another nation, comes through and wipes out the southern part of Israel. Well, throughout the course of time, another nation, yes, another one, I know there's this whole thing going on there, uh, called Persia comes up and allows Israel to go back. But not all of Israel returns, only parts of Israel. Mostly um, the Judeans from the tribe of Judah, um, and some mixed ones of the other ones. But they end up going back. And so you have the Samaritans in what used to be northern Israel, and you have the, um, the remnants of Israel in the southern part of Israel. So as if that's not confusing enough, then there were also other people mixed in with that. So just kind of roll with me on this, okay? Um, anyways, the Jews went back to Israel to build the temple again because it had been destroyed by Babylon. And... Uh, well, the Samaritans say, hey, this seems like a good idea. Let's help them. Which sounds like a good idea, except the, the Jews say, no, we don't want your help. So this causes a whole thing to happen. And the, so the Samaritans start doing things to purposely tear down Israel. They go and make fun of them. You know, they, they, they try and appeal to Persia to get them to stop their labor. I mean, just thing after thing. And so it kind of gets to be this back and forth thing. Uh, until finally, they just kind of finally start fighting against each other. Um, in different skirmishes. Long story short, Samaria ends up building their own temple because they're like, well, fine. We don't need your temple anyways. We'll just do our own temple. And, uh, well, the Jews don't like that very much. So they go and destroy their temple. And, uh, well, the Samaritans didn't really like that. So then we have Rome coming into the scene when it's already a heated situation. <laughs> and then they're like, okay, hey, you guys, stop fighting. 
you know, because that's what people always try to do when they come into somebody else's nonsense. I mean, well, I could give you a lot of examples of that. <laughs> so obviously that didn't work. Duh. I mean, if it was that simple, I think we would have resolved the whole tiff in Jerusalem with the Jews and uh, Muslims, you know, that whole thing. Uh, but anyways, so they're all upset with each other. Um, and so Jesus used a very natural tension that existed in his culture. In this story, he uses, um, you know, the Samaritan as being the good guy. And this, this Jew who's testing Jesus is, oh, and he's really having a hard time with this. That person, you know, he was the neighbor or whatever. You know, you can just kind of hear that, hear that not really wanting to answer. The one who showed mercy toward him, whatever, that one. Well, <laughs> nowadays, we kind of lose a lot of that hatred and bitterness. You know, we even have an organization now called the Good Samaritan. Hey, look, how about that? Um, you know, and it's, everybody talks about that. Well, I figured I'd be a Good Samaritan. You know, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a phrase now. I mean, everybody knows about the Good Samaritan. Um, but if Jesus had lived nowadays, he might have said something maybe a little bit different. Maybe he would have said there was a person who got beaten and robbed and a Syrian refugee came by. Maybe he would have said that there was a capitalist who was attacked and a communist came and saved him. Ooh, no, not that. We don't like communists, right? Oh, no. Maybe he would have said about how a Democrat was beat up and a Republican came and saved him, or vice versa. Or vice versa. Oh, well, God forbid that, because we all know Jesus was a Republican. And see what I mean? We have a lot of preconceived biases about this, because... We don't understand how offensive what Jesus just said was. Because we aren't Jews. But what he said was extremely offensive. Just like if you were to go on social media and see the dumb things that people are saying against Republicans and Democrats and this and them and you know everybody's demonizing everybody else. It's the exact same thing. It's the exact same thing. And there's that same hate and bitterness going on there. Um, or heck, maybe he would have said that there was a patriot who was beat up and, a, and, a, and an illegal immigrant came and helped him. <laughs> maybe there's an anarchist that was helped by a veteran. Uh, maybe Colin Kaepernick was helped by a conservative or Colin Kaepernick helped a conservative. I mean, these are things that, boy, man, we would really have a heyday with that. No, Jesus, you don't know. Colin Kaepernick, he's evil. You, you don't understand. See, that's, that's how the Jews felt about the Samaritans. Take whoever you're, you draw the most offense from. Is it Hillary Clinton? Is it President Trump? Whoever you find is the most offensive person, that's what Jesus just did in this story. That's how offensive it was. He took the one thing that, that Jesus, no, we don't go there. You don't understand. Here's the line, Jesus, you crossed it. Because the Samaritans aren't really people. In fact, Jews had their own word for people like the Samaritans. It, it was a, basically a meant dog. They weren't people. But in the story, we have this dog is the only one who did the right thing. And we have these people who are held in high esteem by people doing the wrong thing. And I think that if we don't understand that in the story, we're doomed to not understand the story. Go and do the same as this dog did in this story. Making the dog the hero. See, the problem is, is that we as people we like to put false divisions in our mind, right? Like there's us, and then there's them. Obviously, I'm right, and then there's the people who don't agree with me, and they're the people who are not right, right? And we like to think, well, these are the good guys, these are the bad guys. Some people think Republicans are the good guys, and Democrats are the bad guys. Some people think that Colin Kaepernick is the good guy, and that these people who are upset with him are the bad guys. Some people think that President Trump is the bad guy. See, that's what we do. 
we put up these false lines in our head that this is where God's grace ends and this is where God's love ends. When we're praying for people, we pray for people who matter to us and we expect for it to matter more to God because it matters more to us. But God doesn't have that in his head, does he? He doesn't stop and say, okay, this is Chuck's family, so I love them more. And this is not Chuck's family, so I don't love them as much. This is Israel, so I love them more. These are not, this is not Israel, so I love them less. See, we all believe these things, and somewhere in our heads we, we lie to ourselves and tell us, oh, I don't really believe that. But don't you, though? If you're pushed hard enough, and somebody says enough stupid things to really take you off, why do you get mad about it? Well, because they lied about... See, we like to pretend like we're not that bad off, but then you, you read the newspaper, you go on social media, you, you actually listen to, the, to just the hateful comments that people have to say, we're not, we're not over this, evidently. So people create false divisions. It's always us versus them. The question is, who is the them and who is the us? Well, for a lot of people, it's different things. Historically, it's been based off of skin color, ancestry, religion, politics, historically. But I don't think that that's exactly how God sees things. And a lot of times, the truth is, is that we look for excuses to not love others. God, don't make me have to love Hillary Clinton. God, don't make me have to love President Trump. God, don't make me have to, do you know what I mean? And, I mean, let's use Tularosa as a great example. Look at how much racism there is in Tularosa. Very surprised, see? Up north, the big thing is, you know, whites and blacks. Well, down here, I mean, it's kind of everybody against everybody. It's kind of a free-for-all. I don't know, you know, I haven't been up north in a while, but, I mean, there is still a lot of, jeez. I mean, there's some things that you don't even mean to be offensive, and it's like, oh, that was definitely offensive. Sorry. Um, but here's something we all need to, need to learn, and I'm getting ready to wrap up here. There is not a single human government that has lasted forever, and there is not a single one that will last forever. One day, America will be destroyed. It will either fall naturally, as every nation always has, or it will fall in the end times. Either or, it just depends when the end times is, I guess. See what I mean? It's not something that, well, this is God's nation. No, it's not God's nation. No, <laughs> that's not God's nation, no. <laughs> And we lied to ourselves in this thing of, you know, well, the founding fathers, they were basically the new Israel, you know, and so everything, you know, just applies to America, too. And it's like, no, actually, no, that's definitely not what's going on there. Um, so with that being said, don't let politics keep you from loving others. Don't let somebody's difference of opinion make them less in your eyes. And so just a few things here in closing. The first is that these arguments will not matter in the new heavens and the new earth. In the resurrection, do you honestly think that we'll be divided by political leanings? No. No. Not a bit. We aren't even going to be, we aren't going to even have the same family bonds that we had here on earth. We aren't going to have skin color like we do here on earth. None of these things are going to matter. They are a waste of time. So when we allow ourselves to be divided over these stupid lines that we ourselves have drawn, all that we're doing is making another step between somebody and hearing the gospel. Jesus said to love your neighbor as yourself. He didn't say, go and make sure that your neighbor thinks like you. He said, love your neighbor as yourself. Did the Samaritan ask the man who was beat up, excuse me, what's your ancestry? Did you vote for Trump? No, he didn't say any of that. He saw someone in need, and he loved them. 
That is what God told us to do. Love your neighbor as yourself. Which just an FYI, it's a lot easier to love people if you're not on social media. Just throwing that, that out there. It, somehow, Facebook attracts the worst of everything. And people who are generally nice to you will be very hateful to you online. Just, I don't know why, but that's just kind of how it is. Um, I've actually gotten off of Facebook recently, and it's wonderful. Oh, it is wonderful. So free. The world seems to be so much better. I mean, the, the air seems to be cleaner. Man, oh man. It's just great. If you're still on Facebook, <laughs> I laugh at you. And then the last point, oh, I guess I already went through it. Sorry there. Um, so let, love your neighbor, whether they have different culture, different skin, different politics, different opinions, different religion, different ancestry, or different economic standing. There is not a single one of those things that actually matters in God's sight. God loves people, and he told us to love our neighbor as ourselves. So who is our neighbor? Yes, is the correct answer to that. Yes. Yes, that person is your neighbor. Um, I know that was relatively simple. I think that the hardest part was just getting through that whole nonsense between the Jews and the Samaritans. Ooh, I just think that was going on for hundreds of years, so ooh, glad I wasn't a part of that. Um, so we're going to go ahead and close. The, the, really, the thing I want you to remember out of all of this is love your neighbor as yourself. That's what it comes down to. Jesus taught it 2,000 years ago and still just as applicable today as it was back then. Um, can, I have, uh, can I have Randy closes in prayer, please?